that, ho- that was a whole episode really about that decision and how they came up with this turtle race to make the decision. And y- y- you can see I was jumping kind of through there to fit it in a time slot. Um, but it was really about a decision he had to make and the process he went through. And there was a couple little bits in there that you heard where Phil says, you know, when I come up against a dilemma, I take a walk in the woods and I ask the Almighty about it. And then Willie said, it's going to take a little divine intervention. And then they wound up having turtles race for it. But in that process, when his turtle won, it meant he would leave. He realized that in his heart he really didn't want to leave. And so that's how that whole thing came back together again. We're talking about guidance now. Let me start with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Really one of the most well-known passages of the Bible. Many, many people that I've talked to through the years actually have this as a favorite uh, of all their Bible verses. Let me read it for you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Now, uh, this passage is all about uh, guidance. Uh, it's talking about guidance, and whenever I think of guidance, I think of uh, driving somewhere where you've never been before. It really wasn't all that long ago when we had to get out the old road atlas. Remember those? You had your, in your car under your seat, you had at home a road atlas, you'd have to get it out. Remember unfolding the big uh, state maps or the city maps? You had to actually look in to find the road to turn on, and you'd kind of map out a direction in your mind. Remember your wife saying, honey, do you really know where you're going? Maybe we should stop and ask for directions. Well, no more. First there came MapQuest on your computer, then in one of the great technological advances of the 21st century, GPS. Now we, most of us have on our phones a GPS system where now all we have to do is speak the destination into the phone and voila, and your navigation app begins to talk to you in that eerie female voice. I think the, uh, the, the iPhone versions have Siri, I have a droid, I'm not sure what her name is, but this eerie female voice starts telling you where to turn. So if you really think about it, after all the technological advances, nothing's really changed. It's still a woman telling you uh, when to turn, (laughs) which is a little bit depressing. But at least we don't have to ask for directions. But how do we find guidance in our lives? Most of us have been at a crossroads like Willie was in that episode, at a crossroads in our professional lives. New job opportunity comes along, or maybe we lose the old job for whatever reason, and we're forced to make a key decision. Now, I'm curious, how many of you here this morning have had to make that sort of job crossroad decision in the last three years? Anybody make a big change in the last three years? Okay, keep your hands up. Last five years? Last ten years? Okay. A lot of us, because that's the way the world is today. I've seen statistics that say the average adult man will change uh, jobs like seven times in his adult life, and career paths will change like three times in your adult life. It's not like anymore you go to work for one company and stay there your whole life. Very few people get that opportunity. Most of us are making these key crossroads decisions every few years in our professional lives. So how do we know? How do we know which decision to make? How do we know what God wants us to do? How do we know what job he wants us to take? Does he care? Does he care about those sorts of things? Does he guide? And if he does guide, how does he guide? That's what we're going to talk about today. First, The Bible teaches us that God does guide, and he guides through his word. The place we start is he guides through his word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Now that means that we lean on God's understanding as well as our understanding, and God's understanding comes through his word. God does speak. If there's anything I believe, uh, I believe that. God does speak. He's always speaking, but we can't just flop open the Bible and uh, at random pick passages and have him speak to us. It doesn't really work that way. There's an old preacher's story. This is your second groaner of the day. Um, It goes like this. Ten years after graduating from high school, Tom runs into an old classmate, Fred, who had once been voted most unlikely to succeed in his high school class. But when he sees Fred ten years later, Fred's driving a $70,000 car and wearing a tailored suit. And Tom is stunned. So he says, Fred, nice car, nice suit. How'd you do it? And he goes, well, it's like this, Tom. My grandma left me a small inheritance, and then the good Lord guided me to turn it into a boatload of money. I just took a Bible, flipped it open at random, and put my finger down on the page. And the first time I did it, it landed on the word oil. So I invested in an oil well company, and the money started rolling in. Then I went back to the Bible, flipped it open again. This time my finger came down on gold. So I bought a bunch of gold coins and doubled my money in a year. The Bible's awesome. Tom congratulates him, hurries back to pick up his own Bible, and says, if it works for that knucklehead, I'm sure it's got to work for me. So he flips open his Bible, plops his finger down on the page, and it says, chapter 11. (laughs) I told you, two groaners in one day, it's a bonus day. 
Now, I have to say that I have heard stories sometimes that, that sound a little like that, that, that seem like they're genuine, where a word or a phrase in the Bible has had sort of direct impact on someone's career choice. I'll tell a story about that in just a minute. But those are the exceptions. We do find guidance in God's Word, but it doesn't work like a magic eight ball. It doesn't work like that. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Now those verses are saying, if we pay attention, that the first decision we make is to honor God in our hearts and in our lives. To live in a relationship with him. To seek to obey and follow God in our lives. And then we can trust him to guide our paths. See how that works? There are a whole lot of people who try to use God kind of like a genie in a bottle. That is, they live however they want. They make, however, make their decisions based on whatever they want. They live kind of like they are God and they can make the rules until they come up against it, until they get in trouble, and then they try to start rubbing the bottle. And then they try to start looking for guidance. Then they pick up the Bible. Then they pray. I saw the story this week, uh, just a little bit about it, about the South African... Um, Paralymp Paralympic athlete Oscar Pistorius, you know, the guy who uh, stands accused of shooting his girlfriend. Oh, well, the doctor who was the first on the scene said when he found him, he was uh, kneeling over his girlfriend who had been shot like four times, and he was screaming uh, to God, let her live, let her live. I'll commit my life to you. I'll live for you. I'll do anything you want me to do. Just let her live. Okay. So he waited till that moment. Whatever else had happened, whoever shot who, he waited till that moment. Now he's crying out, rubbing the bottle, trying to get God's help. It's a little bit late in that situation, don't you think? It's a little bit late. He's got the cart before the, hor before the horse there. It doesn't really work that way. The first step is to make, uh, make the decision and ask yourself, am I living in a right relationship with God? Is there anything in my own life and relationships that he wants to clean up? Is there any way in which I'm not acknowledging him? Deal with that first. I had a guy actually a couple of years ago try to convince me in my office um, that it was God's will for him to have an affair with someone who was not his wife. He said, well, uh, his argument was, God wants me to be happy, right? He wants me to have joy, right? Well, she makes me happy. That was the extent of his argument. And I said, uh, time out. It's not really the way it works. We can't decide and then ask God to bless our decision because that's what we've already decided. Uh, we need to distinguish between what theologians refer to as God's perfect will and his permissive will. Now, God's perfect will is what God wants for all of us all the time. And the Bible makes those things exceedingly clear. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is God's will that you keep away from sexual immorality. It's God's will. That's why I could go back to that guy in my office and say, No, 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 no. That's not God's will. That's just what you want. Here's God's will. He's already told you what God's will is. So don't. God's made it abundantly clear. In another place, uh, Paul writes, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. God's perfect will for us is to be thankful in prayer. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of imperatives in the Bible, far too many to summarize today. But if we take Scripture seriously, we know it's God's will for all of us to worship Him, to uh, thank Him for His gifts, to love God and our neighbors and even love our enemies, to feed the poor, seek justice for the oppressed, invite the homeless into our homes, and so forth. And on and on we go. To grow the fruit of the Spirit in all of our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It's what God wants for all of us all the time. His perfect will. Mark Twain said, it's not the things in the Bible I don't understand that trouble me. It's the things I do understand. God wants certain things for all of us all the time. That's his perfect will. Then we can move to thinking about his permissive will. That is the individual specific decisions of our lives. What job to take, what house to buy, what investments to make, and so on. Now, several questions need to be asked. First, is there anything in this particular decision? Willie's got a job opportunity. You have a job opportunity. Is there anything in this particular decision that dishonors God? I know what God wants for me as a Christian man. Is there anything in this decision that dishonors him? I had a guy uh, come talk to me years ago because he had a new job opportunity. It was a much better job opportunity. Paid a lot more money, but it was working in the front office of a casino business. And he was wrestling with, is that dishonoring to God? And as he wrestled with it, he finally came to the conclusion that even though it was better here and here and here, he couldn't 
do it in good conscience because he felt like it dishonored the God he was trying to serve. Is there anything here in this decision that's counterproductive to what I know he wants from my life? For example, there's a job opportunity, but it's going to require you to travel a lot more, and it's at a particular time in a son or daughter's life when they might need you at home. That involves wrestling with, with things, asking God. Is there anything in this decision that's more temptation rather than opportunity? Is there anything in here that would hurt God's reputation? If not, if it's okay, 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 based on what we know God wants for us, then it's time to move to the next level of guidance, which I'm calling God guides through his spirit or through prayer. God guides through his spirit through prayer. Uh, years ago, uh, before I was married, uh, my wife and I, the woman who became my wife and I, were just dating. We'd been dating about a year. And I was coming to that point where I kind of needed to make a decision about the relationship. Uh, and it scared me a little bit uh, because it was... I needed to decide whether I was going to commit to this relationship, get engaged, and move down that pathway, or whether I was going to just move on and look for the next one. And so right when I was in that, right when I was in that process, I, I went on a short-term mission trip to South America. It was about a six-week trip. In the middle of that trip, I'm thinking about all this, wrestling with all this, so I went out to pray one night, and I remember I was out in the middle of this big field, just, a, just in the middle of nowhere, dark sky, a perfect situation, just by myself, just, just, just kind of praying up to God, what should I do? And all things going through my mind were, you know, I, I think, I think I might, this might be the one, I, I think I might want to commit, but I had all these questions, but what if this happens, what if that happens, what if she's not who I think she is, what if this, what if that, and I was, I was just scared. And in that time, you know, in the, in, 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 I felt God whisper back to me, it wasn't out loud, just inside myself, and what he said was, uh, why don't you worry about you? and I'll worry about her. And I said, hmm. He goes, why don't you ask me to help you become the man I want you to become, and I'll help her become the woman that you need her to be. Okay. And by the time I got home, I knew what the answer was, I knew the direction I was going to go, and God has fulfilled that prayer in my life. God does care about the particulars. This is what I call the, the still, small voice of God, who does speak. But we need to be very careful here. We need to be very careful saying God spoke to me or God speaks to me. Because sometimes it's just our emotions. Sometimes it's just what we want. In Acts chapter 16, there's a great story about the Apostle Paul who is traveling around that part of the world, uh, what we now call Turkey, preaching the gospel, planting churches and so forth. And, and the Bible says he got to one point and the Spirit of God prohibited him from going in one direction. They said it wouldn't allow him to go to that direction, so he was confused. And then that night he has a dream, and in the dream he sees a man from Macedonia, which was Greece, kind of the other direction. And the man says to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so the next day he packs up and he heads that way uh, to help in that region. God led him through a dream. I actually used that particular passage when I was recruiting Jeff Frazier to leave the church where he was serving at the time and come join us about 15 years ago. I wrote him a note after I met with him and interviewed him. I wrote him a little note card, and all I wrote on it was the uh, coordinates of that verse. I wrote Acts 16.9, knowing he would go and be curious and read it and knowing that he would know what I was saying, and it worked. Got him to come over here and help us. That's the other story. Now, a careful distinction between the guidance of the Holy Spirit on our own emotions and our own desires. I knew a guy in college who used uh, the spiritual speak to, as, as a uh, pickup line for girls. Uh, it was a Christian college environment. He would say, you know, I've been praying about this, and I think God wants us to date. He really would. And it would work until he got the one young lady who said, you know, God speaks to me too, and you're a jerk. She said... <laughs> God does speak, but we have to be listening. And when we think God may have spoken to us through his word or maybe through our hearts or through prayer, we need to check it against God's word. We need to check it with others who know us well and who know God. And it's by the combination of word and spirit and wisdom God guides. That leads us to the third point is that God guides also through circumstances. He guides us through his word. He guides us through prayer, the inner voice, and he guides us through circumstances. Um, my wife and I came to FBCG in 1986, but God used a series of circumstances to get us here. At the time, um, I was interviewing at several places and looking at several opportunities. I interviewed at two churches, one in New York, about 10 minutes from where I grew up, and one here, First Baptist of Geneva. Two completely different jobs. The one here was a youth pastor job. The one there was an associate pastor of pastoral care. At the time, I was studying uh, in a graduate degree in, in counseling and psychology and so forth, and I envisioned myself as a counselor more than a preacher at that time. So I interviewed both places back-to-back, and on the plane flight home from here, 
uh, to where we were living at the time, I told my wife, well, Geneva, that's a nice second choice. Because I thought in my heart, it all made sense to go to New York. Better job, better pay, better career track, close to where I grew up, it made sense. And so the Monday night after I we came home from Geneva, I was supposed to get a call from New York, and the pastor was supposed to offer me the job, give me the salary package and all that. So I got the call, and the pastor on the other end said, I can't, don't know how to tell you this, but I don't have a job to offer you because my elders walked out on me last night in a meeting. Okay. Uh, he had no job, and he was in trouble, struggling with his own job. But I had been there and interviewed the week before. I had no I didn't even pick that up in the meeting. There was a lot of tension there. So I hung up the phone, and I told my wife, looks like we're going to Geneva. Okay. See, my wisdom said I'm going there. Circumstances and God's leadership said, no, you're going there. And it turns out, almost 30 years later, that was God acting in my life, leading through circumstances. Now, I've heard many stories through team guys through the years. Losing a job, devastating, don't understand, doesn't make any sense, wind up in a different job, different place, different state, different house, different schools, and realize three or four years later that the change of schools was extremely good for one of their children. And it makes sense, only looking back across the circumstances. Or the change prompted the move to a new church home, which, event, which eventually blesses the whole family. Now, the hard thing about God's guidance through circumstance is that we usually can't see it when it's happening. We only see it in retrospect, looking back across the years. We only see it later. That's why the scripture verse says, Trust in the Lord, acknowledge him, honor him with your life, and he will make your paths straight. Lastly, God guides us through wisdom. Fourth is God guides through wisdom. In James 1, chapter, uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, the Scripture says, If any of you lacks wisdom, which pretty much <laughs> includes all of us, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask. See, wisdom is applying knowledge to our life circumstances and to our decisions. It's applying knowledge. It isn't just piling up knowledge in our heads. It's just not knowing a thousand Bible verses. It's applying that to real life situations. And God has given us the powers of reason, powers of discernment, powers of intelligence to be used for his purposes. Now, I can give an example here through helping my boys, the three of them so far, through the decision to go to college. Many of you have done the same thing. You help your children make decisions about school, jobs, you know, all that stuff. And I didn't teach them, just open the Bible, point your finger down, and it'll tell you where to go to college. Because it doesn't really work that way. I want them to know God's word. More importantly, I want them to know God and know how to follow his guidance and don't want them to know how to make wise decisions. So we told them, the first off, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God's wisdom and God's direction in your life. And then we're going to ask a whole bunch of questions. We're going to do the work. We're going to do the work of discerning. We're going to ask questions like, what kind of college do you want to go to? Big, small, state university, private Christian school. What kind of atmosphere are you looking for? We made visits to all those kinds of schools. How far away do you want to be? What do you want to study? Do they have the program you want to study in? Do you want to play a sport? If you want to play a sport, you just want to make a team, you want to actually try to get on the court. It's a process of asking all the questions and discerning through the process of seeking wisdom. And through that process of answering all those questions, using the faculties God's given us, he makes our paths straight and clear. So, God does care, Scripture tells us. God is willing to guide. He wants to guide. But it's not magic. It's not magic. We must put ourselves in a position to hear his voice, to know his guidance. It comes through his word, you must be filling your mind and your heart with God's word so you can recognize it when he is speaking to you. We must, uh, his guidance comes through prayer. You must spend time alone. You must spend time on your own getting to know and listen to that voice of all the other voices. You must know that voice of the Spirit through prayer. Guidance comes through the wise counsel of others. You got to be around other people who also are walking in the same direction, who know you, who you can bounce things off of. Hey, I think that God might be, does this sound like me? Does this sound like him? Does this make sense to you? And finally, guidance comes through experience and through circumstance. Here's the questions I want you to ask around your table today. First, what was the last time you had to face a major career decision? What was the decision and how do you go about making that decision? Apply some of these things to your own life experience. What's the last time you went through the job change decision? How did it go for you? Secondly, when you need to make a key decision, do you tend to want to make those decisions on your own? Or do you tend to seek guidance from other sources? There are kind of two kinds of decision makers. There's one 
like I would tend to be. I tend to back myself up, think about it a lot, and then go out and check with other people. Other folks go to other people first and other sources first, then go and think about it on their own. How do you go about making your big decisions? Thirdly, can you point to a time in your life when you believe, looking back, you received guidance from God, either through his word, through prayer, that private, still, small voice in your heart, or through a circumstance. Looking back, you've received that guidance. Talk about those things. Wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.